Hi, I'm Saida Garrett, co-writer of Michael Jackson's Man in the Mirror, and you're listening to Rainbow Country with Mr. Mark Tara. The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the persons appearing on the program. Today on Rainbow Country, in Hour One, award-winning best-selling Canadian author... Shyam Salvadori joins me to talk about his latest novel, Mansions of the Moon. Plus, in hour two, I catch up with Kevin Jacobs to find out how life is after winning season 10 of Big Brother Canada. All that and more coming up on episode 309, so stay tuned for Gay Talk Radio right here on Rainbow Country. Hi, this is Carol Pope. Hi, I'm Garrett Conley, author of Boy Erased, a memoir. Hi, I'm Lorraine Segato. Hi, I'm Gord Depp of the Spoons. You're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. Well, hello and welcome to a brand new journey through Rainbow Country. As I like to call it, a little gay radio show working to give voice to the LGBT community and beyond. And as always, I am your tour guide through Rainbow Country. I'm producer and host, Mark Tara. By the way, Rainbow Country originates from CIUT FM in Toronto, and now proudly in syndication on 12 outlets across Canada, from coast to coast to coast. The Yukon, British Columbia, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, the east coast of Canada in Newfoundland, Ontario, even down to Buffalo, New York, and online. Well, thanks to you tuning in, streaming, downloading, but ultimately listening. Together, we continue to build Rainbow Country into a nationally syndicated gay radio show, a number one LGBT podcast on Podomatic.com's gay and lesbian chart, and by the way, last week, we were number two. As well as being recognized as Canada's number two LGBT podcast on Feedspot.com. So today, my one-on-one with Kevin Jacobs. We'll find out how his life has evolved since being crowned winner of season 10 of Big Brother Canada. What plans may lie ahead for him, and so much more. Plus, music-wise, I'll be featuring some 80s Divine, as well as some 90s Malcolm McLaren. But at first, my conversation with award-winning best-selling Canadian author Shyam Salvadori starts us off with a reading from his latest novel, Mansions of the Moon. Phone rings. I got a message from the mayor. He's going to call me back the next day. I get the call and he said, if you'd accept, uh, would you, we'd like to honor you with the key to the city. There was an event um, later that year in May. Just a key, right? Like key to what? A decent job, uh, a good singing career. Uh, it's really a metaphor, but it's history. So a reporter wants to talk to me and says, uh, you know, well, so it's key, right? Like, what's the big deal? I said, well, not everybody gets the key. So I looked it up, and I guess it is kind of a big deal. The date, May 17th, 2018, when trans activist Susan Gapka made history by becoming the first trans woman to be presented with the key to the city of Toronto. By the way, past recipients include Rush and the Raptors. Hi, I'm Simone Denny, and you're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara.
This is from the opening pages, and you should know that the word Dahare means child. Uh, and Ushas is one of the nicknames of the protagonist, Yasodhara. One morning, Yasodhara wakes to the shriek of an owl, and this sound, unnatural in the daytime, fills her with a foreboding that is only heightened by the heat sharpening her nerves to a knife's edge. So, when she looks up from picking flowers in the wall garden and sees her aunt hurrying towards her face contorted with worrying news, it is as if she's been expecting whatever calamity is about to come. Prajapati reaches her and takes a flower basket from her hand. Come, Dahari. She leads the way to a bench under a tree, and Yasodhara suddenly finds it hard to breathe. Once they are seated, Prajapati wipes away sweat from her upper lip, then holds both Yasodhara's hands in her own and regards her somberly. Oh, Ushas, I don't know how to say this. It's Siddhartha. He's alive. Yasodhara snatches her hand back. But that can't be. He's dead. Padapati gently shakes her head. He reappeared in the city of Rajagaha. A messenger from the Emperor Bimbisara just arrived for your uncle with the news. But that that's not possible. No ascetic who's taken a fast unto death can last ten years. Your uncle, I wanted you to know before the news spreads. Her aunt blinks at her. He's staying just outside Rajagaha with a hundred Samanas who follow him. The Buddha, the awakened one, is evidently how he wishes to be called. But awake from what? No one knows. Yasodhara stands and remains unmoving for a long moment. Then before she can help herself, she cries out, I wish he was dead. Why is he alive? Why? Ignoring her aunt's appalled look, she wraps her shawl around herself and hurries through the archway and out to the garden. Shyam Salvadorai, hi, how are you? Good, thank you for having me. Uh, you're more than welcome. Thank you for being here to have your voice, your story be heard by the LGBT community and beyond. Shyam, first of all, did I say your name correctly? Yes. Yay! <laughs> So, yeah, I think it's in Salvador Ray, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Let's start here with yourself. Words. Words have meaning. Words have weight. Words have history. Words have power. For yourself, when did you discover your love of words? You're just, you discovered your love for writing, for storytelling. When did this uh, all materialize and, and you recognized your talent for writing? When did that happen for you? Well... As a child, I liked to uh, write, write plays. And then I just staged the plays in my parents' drawing room. And then I went on to, uh, to be in theatre. And uh, and I actually got my degree in theatre from York University in directing. So I, I was really thinking of being a writer. And then in my fourth year in at uh, York, I took a playwriting course um, uh, with this uh, wonderful um, artistic director, Urjo Karida, who used to run the Tarragon Theatre. And I just loved writing. I just realized how much I loved it. And by then, I wasn't that interested in being in theatre. Um, and I, I realized that writing is um, was also temperamentally suited to somebody who was quite introverted and liked to spend a lot of time on their own. So I... Um, thought about it and I thought, well, you know, there's no real future at that point in the 80s for somebody who's South Asian in theatre. So I just decided I would consciously switch to writing fiction because fiction writers like Rohit and Mystery were beginning to have success there and be published by mainstream presses. And then it was just a question, a sort of process by which I... um, sort of fell in love with uh, writing fiction and um, language was always a part of it, but it was always, initially it was always in service of the plot and characters, but it's only over time that my 
love of uh, of language has actually grown rather than you know stab- stabilized and um because you realize that la- i've come to realize that language is so um important in 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 drawing the reader into the world you've created um and holding them there and that, that that's it's the rhythm of the language that actually does that and so I'm very, con- I'm very kind of interested in that. I'm very conscious of it when I'm writing. So you have, you have a theater background. Yes. D- did any of your novels, did it ever occur to you to maybe adapt it for the stage? Because no. one, of, one, Funny Boy, was adapted for the screen. Yes, which I did, yes. Um, so I adapted that for the screen and uh, with Deepa Mehta. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I was it was a I was I was one primary adapted it, and um, so I mean the thing about the novels is the reason one of the reasons why I moved from theater to to uh, fiction is that the uh, the novel has greater possibilities. You can introduce any number of characters you want. You can have any number of settings. You can be as descriptive as as you want. Whereas theater, you know, you just can't do that. It's too expensive. So going back from this kind of uh, the freedom of the novel to the restriction of the theater. Um, you weren't work. willing to go there. <laughs> no, I wasn't, I wasn't willing to go back to it, but I wasn't willing. I mean, I, I think I, I think that I see that the theater has a certain power to it, power of the actor on stage, you know, sort of feeding off the audience so there is that. That's very attractive. I mean, that's very attractive as a writer. It's much more attractive than film in some way um, to see that. Um, so I do think about that, especially after I've done the uh, screenplay. Um, and um, I love I love actors. I just love uh, watching them work. I love uh, being around them. I think their, their extroverted nature kind of completes me in a way. I mean, it allows me to get out of myself. Uh, so I... I yeah, I mean, I think about it, but I don't know about adaptation of a novel, of my novels into theater. Mm. Certainly to film. So Mansions of the Moon, this is your current novel. Mm-hmm. Talk to me about the story that you're telling in this novel. What is this story all about that you're telling? Well, it's a story of the uh, Buddha's wife, Yasodhara, uh, who's a, a personage who's very absent from the earliest uh, Buddhist texts in the in what's called the Pali Canon, and um, I'd never really heard of her, even though I'd read a lot of those texts. And I discovered her through a friend of mine, who's an academic, who uh, who, had, uh, who had translated a poem by uh, called the Asodaravatta, and uh, I just became fascinated once I found out that I mean I knew the Buddha had a wife. But I didn't know very much about her, and um, I just became fascinated by by her. And people have, because she's so absent in the original texts uh, and so mysterious, uh, people have always been uh, writers have always been very fascinated by her poets, uh, songwriters, theater, novels, because uh, you know you're always drawn to these characters who are on the margins of history. Uh, because their their point of view is always so unique on the historical event, and um, so I was very interested in her. But I think also, I think part of the reason why uh, people are so fascinated by Yasodhara is that she um, her story embodies a fundamental human fear, which is the fear of abandonment by those we love, and how one might make sense of a life. Um, once one is one has been abandoned, and um, so I just I just I don't know I just became very interested in that. And by then I was very interested in trying to tell Siddhartha's story, uh, um, but I didn't know. But I just could, felt like I couldn't do it completely from his point of view, and that I couldn't bring it alive quite in the way I wanted to. But when I discovered her. I realized that this was a perfect uh, point of view through which to bring um, Siddhartha to life. Um, so, and also, I mean, just kind of, 
the research into 6th century BC India was um, fascinating to do and so interesting and um, so oddly familiar. The world felt very familiar and it just made me realize that, um, actually I didn't realize it, a, f- a friend of mine who's a famous archaeologist in Sri Lanka made me realize that that actually the world of South Asia hasn't really changed that much ex- until about the mid 70s. Uh, that, that, that there was this continuity in, in terms of everything, in terms of the way people dressed, uh, the way social life occurred. Um, so uh, I, I felt comfortable in that world. I felt very comfortable in it. Uh, once I had uh, completed the research and realized I could write the novel. Mm-hmm. So a, a reimagining of ancient India through the life of uh, Yasohara, uh, the woman who would marry, who would marry a yeah. Buddha. Is it is it fair to say that Mansions of the Moon is a work of both fact and fiction? Well, <laughs> I mean, fact, uh, yes, to some extent, but you know, I mean, there's very little. Uh, there's not that much information, actually. Uh, I mean, a lot of it come. Don't forget, a lot of it just passed down orally, um, and only written down, I think, in the second mm-hmm. century AD. Mm-hmm. So you, I mean, it's not to say that the oral tradition is uh, is uh, inaccurate. You know what I mean? It's not to say because things are passed down. Maybe we, we as human beings can't memorize uh, the way that people in that time could memorize. But you know, we we just are incapable of that. So it is possible to pass down through memory uh, something pretty accurate. Um, but uh, yeah, I would say it's more of a yeah, I don't know. Fact, it's it's what's come down to us. It's a fact. Mm-hmm. When you say fact, is what's come down to us, combined with fiction. Mm-hmm. Is this also a, a story of female empowerment? Maybe even a feminist story. Feminist. Yes, yes, it is. I mean, it is. A, I mean, obviously, the term wouldn't have existed then. It's a story of a woman coming into her own. Yes. Yes, to mm-hmm. that extent, yes. You're a Buddhist? Yes. I had become very interested in Buddhism since about the early 2000s. I um, I had read Karen Armstrong's uh, a biography of the Buddha, and I was immediately uh, interested. I, it was not, I mean, I grew up in a Buddhist country, but it was not the, the Buddhism that I knew, which was more of a, a religion, religion, um, a lot of superstition and ritual and also all the other problems that religion, organized religion does have. So it didn't resemble that and nor did it resemble the sort of mystical new agey kind of self-regarding, mm. navel-gazing Buddhism mm-hmm. that one often finds in the West. You know, everybody is Buddhist, right? Every Hollywood right. celebrity is a Buddhist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's not, it's, it wasn't that kind of a Buddhism either that I discovered in Armstrong's but also in subsequent reading, and I, I just felt like it was a, it was a, a, I suppose by that time I was looking for an ethical structure that didn't involve a, a supreme being uh, with which to make sense of, of how we live, of how I, li- I live. And I felt for me that, for me, it was a good fit. Um, and so, and also, you know, one of the other misconceptions about Buddhism is that it's a, um, that it's a forest religion, you know, that it takes place in sort of forests and, you know, uh, Buddhist monks meditating on the trees and all this kind of stuff. But it isn't at all. It's an urban religion that, that came out of the problems of, urban, of, of, of the urbanization of India at that time. And with urbanization comes the accumulation of wealth among a certain class. Um, and that's what happened um, in India. And the Buddha was, Siddhartha himself, was from that class that accumulated. Wealth. So he could see its problems. And he was interested in the problem of wealth and the problem of how to be happy in this in an, in an urban environment. Uh, and all his monasteries are set um, are either in these or in the great cities of his time or just outside the great cities of his time. Uh, so that, you know, there's this very strong, I mean, there's this very kind of connect. There's a very strong connection between the urban and Buddhism. So I found that very. I found that that made it a kind of um, 
philosophy that suited uh, the life of an urban person like me. Um, so I, I just, uh, yeah, I mean, I, it was fit. So was it your discovery of Buddhism and you becoming a Buddhist? Was that maybe the, the, the flashpoint that led you on the path to create this new novel? Of course. Yes, it, of course it did. Uh, because I had also started then to look at Buddhist stories, the ancient Buddhist stories. Mm. And I was very interested by the way in which they, uh, they created a narrative that was different from Western narrative because it was a narrative that incorporated the tropes of Buddhism, not just the narratives, but the character types. And, and I'd actually already done, I'd actually already begun to do that with my uh, previous novel, The Hungry, the Hungry Ghosts which looks at trauma you know, in a sort of through Buddhist term, eyes, you know, or, or not through Buddhist eyes, but in a kind of um, a Buddhist worldview, if you would, if you'd like, on trauma and, and also sexuality and all those other uh, aspects of that book. So I'd already begun that work and I was just interested in going further uh, with that. And it felt like uh, this book was the way to keep doing that, to keep, uh, you know, sort of creating this hybrid form that I was trying to create between, um, you know, these stories and their uh, unique structure and character types and the Western realist novel. So there's kind of a hybridity uh, going on. Mansions of the Moon. Mansions of the Moon. This title. Is there a story behind this title? Because I'm sure there is, because it's a unique title. No. It just comes from a quote that I found in the um, in a in a collection of, of uh, an ancient collection of, of poems called the stories of the I was called the stories of the sisters or the women's stories called the Theory Gatha and it's it forms the uh, epigraph of the novel um, and um, so I loved it I I, th- I thought it it really worked and I thought uh, I would use it. <laughs> So this uh, reading is from Siddhartha's point of view and the word Samana means acid. That evening, they climbed the steps to a pavilion in the royal garden, brightly lit with many lamps, and found the naked Samana seated cross-legged, his shriveled sex in his lap. The Samana's emaciated body was covered with dust, ribs pressing against the thin gray skin, knees and elbow joints painfully bony. He was a niganta and so was slowly starving himself to death to extinguish all possible rebirths. Seeing them, he gestured to a water pot in the pavilion. Thirsty. He didn't wish to gain any further negative karma by lifting the water pot to his lips and destroying the tiny life forms within. Siddhartha picked up the pot and held it up to the ascetic's lips. Many sticks of incense had been lit in there, but he could still smell the man's stench of urine and dried feces. I see, O Samana, Siddhartha said, that you won't pick up the pot yourself, but you see no contradiction in destroying the life forms by ingesting them. Siddhartha glanced at the Maharaja, who nodded subtly to encourage him, his eyes glittering, as if Siddhartha were his favorite horse, and he was backing him in a race. The Samana smacked his lips and said nothing, refusing to take up the challenge. After Siddhartha put down the empty pot, he stepped far enough away to diminish the smell and examine the man curiously. Ask me what you will. Then he got into gesture at him with his palms open. He smiled thinly to say that he knew Siddhartha had been brought to challenge him, but also to let Siddhartha know that he was unflustered. And on that note, we will return after this Rainbow Country update. Hi, I'm Paul Poirier. Canadian champion in ice dance and three-time Olympian. 
and you're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Terra. Canada-wide 2S LGBT QQIA plus community survey is looking for your involvement. The Our Health survey aims to explore the current state of health among two-spirit, lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, questioning, intersex, asexual, and other sexually and gender diverse people in Canada. The study team especially wants to hear from community members who are living with chronic health conditions like diabetes, cancer, and fibromyalgia. This is to ensure that people living with conditions that are often underrepresented or less understood are included in this work. Participants will also have the opportunity to do a test at home to screen for COVID-19 antibodies, HIV, hepatitis C, and syphilis. All data collected will be used to advocate for programs, services, and policies that better support the health and well-being of 2S LGBT QQIA plus people across Canada. All participants will receive a small honorarium for completing the survey. For more information, visit cbrc.net forward slash our underscore health. That's C-B-R-C dot N-E-T forward slash O-U-R underscore H-E-A-L-T-H. Summer is in the air. And here's what's on tap for summer 2022. Married couple and Broadway veterans, Stephen Hanna and Brett Shuford, will join me in conversation to talk about their journey towards parenthood via surrogacy. We'll also find out about their online LGBT community for creatives, parents, performers, Broadway husbands. All that and more coming up on Summer 2022, right here on Season 7 of Rainbow Country. I'm Brian Bradley, author of Outrageous Misfits, female impersonator Craig Russell and his wife, Lori Russellidi. You are listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. So you've been a published writer, a, pu- a published author for over 25 years now. Do you have, as a writer, do you have a routine? Like, do you wake up at, say, like, you know, five o'clock in the morning, you start writing till like noon, and then you take a break, and then you go back in the afternoon? Or what What have you? Do you have a, a routine when you are writing? Sure. Uh, I get up, I mean, I try to, um, I get up 6.30 or 7.00. Uh, I may do a little bit of meditation. I, uh, you know, I mean, the whole process of the morning before I sit down to write by about 8.39 is a process of meditation in, in which I'm contemplation, in which even though I'm shaving or doing the dishes or whatever, I'm actually thinking about what I'm going to write that day. <clears throat> then I sit down and work till about maybe 12. Um, then I have a break, have lunch, um, and then the afternoon uh, routine varies depending on whether I'm in um, Toronto or in Sri Lanka. So in Toronto, I will um, maybe just go right back to writing. Um, but in Sri Lanka, I will finish a little earlier, go for a swim, um, have lunch, lie down because it's very hot. And then at about 3.30 or 4, once it cools down, I'll get up and work for another two, three hours. So that, yeah, so that's sort of my day. Um, Of course, you know, that's the ideal day. There are many days 
when I have to do other stuff in the afternoon, such as teaching and marking of student work. So, um, but I try, no matter what happens, I try to keep my mornings sacred um, and just keep them just for the writing. And that's sometimes very hard to do because everything always presses in on you and writing is so difficult that, you know, you sort of <laughs> always looking for an excuse not to do it. Nothing is as difficult as writing, I find, for myself. And so I just, uh, so it's a, it's a real discipline to make myself do that every morning. I, I mean, I love doing it. Don't get me wrong. I love doing it, but it's hard. Mm. So you and your family immigrated to Canada from Colombo, Sri Lanka, when you were, I believe, 19. Mm-hmm. So here's, here's, you know, a hy- hypothetical. Had you not moved to Canada, do you think you would still be a writer? Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, people always talk about it as, it's, as if it's some sort of dichotomy. Uh, but anyways, I was... whether we had Or maybe Canada, you were destined to be a writer. Or well, maybe, who knows? Because anyways, whether I was going to... I mean, my family moved to Canada because of the political situation, but there was always this idea that I would come to America, actually, um, to study, to do my university. And then who knows what might have happened then. So it's not... It is, you know what I mean? It's not like... It wasn't like... It wasn't like intended that I was going to live always in Sri Lanka, there would be these years when I would be in America at a university studying theater. Um, and then I would, um, and who knows what would have happened after mm-hmm. that. So it's, I, I, yeah, it's difficult to say. So your first novel, 1994, is award-winning Funny Boy. Mm-hmm. In 2020, the film version of Funny Boy was released, mm-hmm. directed by Oscar-nominated director Deepa Mehta. You have to find a way not to let these boring people rob you of your precociousness. What you've got to do is this. Don't mess with the grand diva. Don't mess with the grand diva. Yes. Sonali, would you take Arji as your lawfully wedded wife? I do. Arji, would you take Sonali as your lawfully wedded husband? I do. Different. It's wonderful. He's your funny boy. And you are different. Well, uh, I've been on a mockable in Kalis Pandora. You're a fancy, a sissy, a fan. Welcome to Victoria Academy, Arjun Shelvaratnam. Every human creature is constituted to be that profound secret and mystery to every other. Hi. So who cares if he's single leaves, Amma? Him. Auntie will never be allowed into any of our houses if she marries a Sinhalese. I saw you both. It's dangerous and it's illegal. Women and children all butchered simply because we are Tamil. I just can't. We don't want you here anymore. So, what do we do? Will it make you happy? Why does everyone say I'm funny? What does that mean? (laughs) Aj, you're only eight years old. What do you know about love? Don't mess with the Grand Diva. Uh, in 2021, both yourself and Deepa Mehta won the Best Adapted Screenplay at the ninth Annual Canadian Screen Awards. Why do you think the story in, in Funny Boy, your first novel, why do you think this, this particular story resonates and resonated so? I don't really know. I have no Even idea. to this day? No, I don't know why people still... Um... No, I don't know. I have no idea. I, I mean, I, I think that uh, it somehow catches people's imagination in some way. Um, but I suppose, Mark, I don't really ask myself that question anymore. I mean, it's such an irrelevant question to me because 
I moved on. You know, I've written so many novels since then. I'm not really interested in Funny Boy. Uh, I'm interested in Mansions of the Moon. Uh, mm-hmm. So I'm not, you see what I mean? It's like, it's an old book. It's a very old book for me. Uh, but the but movie just came out uh, sure. just a couple of years ago. Sure. So it's still m- relevant as well. Sure, sure. Because of that. Of course. Yeah, of course. But how about, uh, how about we leave the critics to say why, why it's relevant or not? Because you don't write a book thinking this book is going to be relevant and this mm. book is going to be, uh, you know, uh, well, you, you have no idea. You just, it interests you, the subject matter interests you. Uh, you want to do this and so you do it. And then you and then once you start to do it, you're, you're engaged by it and, and, and lost in it. Um, and it changes as you write it and your reasons for writing it change as you write it. Because don't forget a book takes four to eight years, sometimes longer to write. So yours change and everything is changing. Um, and so it's difficult to, at the end, to say, uh, I, I, you know, I mean, it's difficult to, it's not my business in a way to say why it's relevant or not. Mm. Uh and it's, I think it's bad for a writer it's to, to think like that. You can think about why you're doing it in the, in the moment and why it's important, mm-hmm. why you hope it's important to re- readers in the moment and why it's important to you. To and plus, too, moment. you never know what's going to catch someone's attention or catch sure, you sure. Know, society's sure. uh, you know, attention. You just don't know that as a creator. Sure, and you don't know whether... Uh, it will catch the attention when it comes out or it'll catch the attention in 10 years or five mm-hmm. years. Yes. You don't really know this. Um, so, and you can't actually control it. So, so funny. Yeah. So f- f- funny boy became a film with mansions of the moon. Are you, th- are, is that in the back of your mind, the potentiality of this going to the screen? Um, I don't know. I mean, one always hopes for these things, but um, I mean, I don't know. You don't I mean, know. It, I, you know what I mean? Like, it's it's one of those things that you don't really know. I mean, the important thing about but have you thought about that aspect? I or don't the, think about the aspect when I'm writing it at all. No, not of course. But now that the the book is out, it's done. Have, have those thoughts entered your mind? Like, oh, I wonder if this, you know, somebody's going to approach me to adapt this. Hmm. Well, of course, I, I mean, I wonder about it. Like every writer wonders about every one of their books. Uh, but it doesn't concern you. But it, it yeah, not, that, not just that it doesn't, of course it concerns you. I mean, something you really love to have happen. Uh, but it's a big book, so probably if it was anything, it would be more of a mini series mm. um, on a streaming service. Oh yes, on a streaming service, of course. <laughs> but but you can't control these things, and they're they're not. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's just I, I just. I mean, I certainly can't adapt it. I'm far too close to it to do it. I mean, I just wouldn't even know how to. I mean, I'm just so close to it. I couldn't possibly even do that. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't know. You are part of the LGBT community. You are a, a gay man. You're in a same-sex relationship. Growing up in Sri Lanka, did you think that one day you would be uh, able to live freely as a gay man and be married to a man? Did you have those thoughts growing up in Sri Lanka? Well, I thought that if I came out to the West, that was that might be possible. Uh, why not? Because by the 80s, I mean, these things were possible. Ma- not marriage, but then I was never big on marriage. I mean, I was never, it was never a big deal for me. Uh, I think I was more with, a, you know, the possibility of living a life with somebody uh, was uh, something I thought about and I thought might be possible in the West. Mm-hmm. And and for yourself and, and your sexuality, when did you start recognizing that when you were growing up? I was about 13, I think, it came to me that I was gay. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's one of those realizations one sort of makes. And, and 
I, I just mentioned you're you're married. How did you meet your husband? Oh, I don't call him my husband. I, I don't like that. Okay. How, <laughs> how do you, too, your too partner? Or... My partner, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I met him at my book launch for Funny Boy. Uh, mm. And uh, yeah, I don't say very much about my relationship because it's, uh, as I think that's sort of a private thing. Uh, but yeah, I met him then. Mm-hmm. And how long have you guys been together? Since 1994. Okay. I have a random question for you. Sure. Was there supposed to be a queer subplot in Mansions of the Moon? I was, well, yes, there was supposed to be a queer subplot, but it uh, it just didn't work in the context of the book. Yeah, a novel has only so much, it seems such a capacious thing, but it can also only hold so much stuff. And anything that goes beyond that, it begins to tip the novel in a way. It begins to get it, it goes off it gets blurred. So there was, but I just took it out. Uh, and um, yeah, <laughs> it's the novel suddenly worked much better without it. But it was a very small plot, subplot. So you, it was you decided that to take it yeah. out as opposed to yes. say your your publisher or something? No, 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 not at all. So started in, I believe, 2012, a writing workshop, Write to uh, Reconcile, Mm-hmm. What what is right to reconcile? It was a, a creative writing workshop that I ran, or workshops that I ran in Sri Lanka for three years, uh, that combined uh, creative writing with um, reconciliation, and because um, it was just post war at that time, and I, um, yeah, I just I, I wanted to uh, help young people write about this period, but also to teach them the craft of creative writing. So I uh, I came up with this idea and uh, I ran it for three years. And, it, and out of each year came an anthology of work um, f- from uh, that, um, ref- that was a student's work. Um, so yeah, it was a lovely thing to do. I really loved doing it. Uh, I enjoyed meeting and and interacting with young people in Sri Lanka. I enjoyed seeing their work, the way it grew uh, when they were exposed to craft. Um, Do you think that that time doing those workshops and being around uh, your students, did those three years teach you anything about yourself? Or did you come away with that experience learning something about yourself? Hmm. No, not about myself so much, but I learned a lot about them and their words and their experience of the wars. And, uh, but I didn't think I really learned anything about myself. It's an interesting question, but no, I mean, it's, no, I, I don't think I did. I mean, I suppose I don't really, it was work, right? I mean, these things are work. Um, and I don't really think, for myself that I find I learn much about myself through work. Uh, I learn more about myself through contemplation and um, distance and, and sort of, um, it's funny, work never really kind of, um, I never find it uh, revealing or cathartic in that way. I enjoy doing it and it exposes me to, I mean, that kind of something like that uh, exposes me to new experiences and new people and um, gets, uh, allows me to go all over the Sri Lanka. So all of that is wonderful, but I, I don't really think that it um, did, a, does any, did anything else. Because you know, it's not about you, right? It's about the student. Like any kind of teaching, it's not about you. You don't, you know, you don't matter as a teacher. What matters is the student. And, you, and in some sense, I, I think that you serve the student. Um, and especially when you're doing creative writing, you must serve the student. You must serve the vision that the student is trying to um, to bring up to the surface. You have to help them. You have to find out what that is and help them achieve it. So, in a sense, it's yeah, it's very it's very important that I think for me as a teacher that I kind of um, um, not efface my ego, but yes, face my ego in a way that it's not about me. It's about the student. So, my my last question for you. When it comes to to mansions of the moon, and when your audiences uh, 
read this book, read this novel, read this story. Is there a takeaway? Is there a bigger message that you hope your audiences get when they read Mansions of the Moon? Yes, there is the, the idea of, of change and that everything changes and that there is no permanence in the world, which is very much that Buddhist idea and that there's a way in which one can be at peace um, understanding that uh, and accepting it. Um, and part of that, I think, I mean, an important part of accepting that is to accept that the self is also impermanent and that it's, there's no fixed self and that the self also changes and changes and changes. And uh, it's just a bundle of what's called karmic cause and effect or just cause and effect that we hold on to and, and name the self and our identity and stuff. And all that's also constantly changing and shifting as it does for Yasodoro in the novel. Mm. I have to say, Shyam, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being on the show. My pleasure, ma. So this reading is uh, a few, uh, occurs a week after Yasodara has been married to Siddhartha and she goes for the traditional meeting with a courtesan to discuss if there were any um, sexual problems in the marriage bed. And the word Ganika means courtesan and Dahare means um, a child or young girl. When Yasoda arrived at the receiving room on the third floor, she took a moment to let her eyes adjust to the dimness. And then there she was, the courtesan Vimala, seated cross-legged on a charpoy in a ray of sunshine coming through the window. Lovely, with her enchanting heart-shaped face and rounded hips, breast straining against her body's cloth, which she wore secured around her neck in an elaborate knot. She beckoned Yasodara forward with a dimpled smile and said sweetly, Come, Dahare, join me, patting the charpoy and arranging some cushions for her guests. As Yasodara climbed onto the charpoy and settled herself, she found herself smiling back shyly under the Garnika's merry gaze, taking in her plump naked arms the press of her voluptuous thighs against the crisp folds of her dhoti, the scent of jasmine from her hair. When Yasodara was properly settled, Vimala took her guest by the chin and examined her face. So lovely. The entire city speaks of your bridal procession. She turned Yasodara's face this way and that. Ambapali would be envious. Yasodara blushed at this highest compliment a woman could be paid to be compared to the great courtesan of Vesali, the most beautiful woman in the middle country. And, and have you met the great Ambapali, she asked, to deflect further compliments. Vimala nodded and mock grimaced. Oh, no woman, especially someone like me, whose beauty is her career, should meet the great Ambapali. I am nothing but a crow compared to her. So then the stories are true, Yasodara asked breathless, for she had always longed to see this legendary beauty. Vimala nodded and laughed. They say she's not human, but the daughter of an Apsara, and when you see her, you can believe this is true. Her beauty is unearthly. She took Yasodara's hand. Now tell me, Dare, are there any problems in the marital bed? Any questions you want to ask me on how to please your husband? Tell me also how your nights have been this past week. Yasodara blushed, but then seeing the placid professional interests of the Garnica, she narrated the events of their wedding night and her relations with Siddhartha since. Vimala was genuinely happy, and when she was done, declared with the satisfaction of work well accomplished. Ah, then my Gani Kakusuma trained your husband well. She will be pleased to hear that. She let out a merry laugh as Yasodara blushed, embarrassed and also jealous. Vimala took her by the chin again. So very charming. Mansions of the Moon, Cheyenne Salvadorai's latest novel, is available wherever you get your favorite books. 
And by the way, the 2021 movie, Funny Boy, from award-winning director Deepa Mehta, and based on Cheyenne Salvadori's best-selling novel of the same name, is available now on streaming. Hi, I'm Cameron Bailey, Artistic Director and Co-Head of TIFF, the Toronto International Film Festival. You're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. Hi, my name is Joanne Vanicola, and I'm an actor and a writer, and I was first on Rainbow Country with Mark Tara on discussing the massacre at Pulse Club in, in Orlando. Um, I realized how important it was for our community to have a radio station uh, specifically for our issues to, to talk about people in, in the LGBTQ community and to provide a, an outlet for our stories, um, to discuss uh, our politics, culture, and give voice to the to the issues that matter to us, and of course our artists and and um, the things that we do globally, and and talk about culture. And without people like Mark Tara uh, providing a space for this with with a radio show like this, then uh, we wouldn't have that voice. So support, tune in. Thank you. Hi, this is Police Constable Danielle Botno, also known as LGBT Cop, and you're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Terra. This is Hour 2 of Rainbow Country, and later on this hour, some 80s divine. And from the soundtrack to the documentary, Paris is Burning, some Malcolm McLaren. But at first, my conversation with winner of Big Brother Canada Season 10, Kevin Jacobs. Jacobs, hello. How are you? Hi, I'm doing amazing. It's uh, life. Life is really, 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 really good. How are you doing? <laughs> I am better now that I am speaking to you. I have to say thank you for being here to have your voice, your story be heard by the by the LGBT community and beyond. Kevin Jacobs, uh, let's start here with yourself. Big Brother U.S. I believe it's season twenty four. It has. Mm started will you be watching yeah i'm gonna be watching it'll be fun uh one of the cool parts of this experience is that i've been able to meet a lot of people that i look up to from big brother canada from big brother us so it's almost like watching and seeing hey who are these people that i might hang out with eventually with the people that you've met so far some of these big brother alum who has uh impressed you the most or made an impression on you with the people that you've met so far um who stands out you know i've been sort of sur- not surprised but i've been really happy with how nice people have been because you're sort of bonded by this cool uh, and and quite intense experience. I'd say from the Big Brother Canada group, um, a lot of the season eight folk, or excuse me, season nine, the one right before us, were were really kind of of, of chatted with um, uh, 
to Sean. I've chatted with Tara from last year. Um, there are people like Anthony. He was on season uh, season seven. Just in general, I actually haven't really had. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for my bad experience with someone. It hasn't <laughs> happened yet. Okay, so Big Brother Canada season eleven returns in yeah. 2023. Will you be watching that season? Of course, I'll be watching that season. I'll be tuned in. I'll, I'll be plugged in. <laughs> what I mean, it's it, it's also easy to say mm-hmm. right now. I know some people after they go on a show and they're a big fan, they come back and, and they kind of have an adjustment period or maybe they see it differently. I mean, I definitely see it a little bit differently, but I'm still excited to to view it from the other side. For yourself, Kevin, what do you think makes good gameplay when it comes to the Big Brother world? What makes gameplay, in your opinion, good gameplay? So often on on Big Brother or any uh, zero sum competition reality show, and when I say zero sum, I mean um, one person is winning and it's at the detriment of others. So I couldn't have won without other people losing. They have to do badly for me to do well. Um, but what I look for in good gameplay uh, is some sort of fluidity. So often you see a big alliance that um, runs the game with five or six people, and that can be entertaining. There's actually nothing wrong with that in my eyes, but what's more fun for me as a viewer is when the lines are not clearly drawn. People have fluid relationships. You could work with people who you wouldn't expect. People will come together for a vote or two or to evict someone that, that you just wouldn't see coming. To me, it's really exciting when you have no idea what the week ahead or the episode ahead holds. It's interesting. In the the season that you won, season 10 of Big Brother Canada, there were no real big alliances that ran the game, so to speak. Why do you think that that happened? Well, at the beginning of the season... um, There was the Savage Seven. It was the Savage Seven. So Herman won the first HOH and a lot of good sort of big brother game theory is that you win the first HOH, you build an alliance that's going to get you somewhere. And he did that. He played it exceptionally well. And then uh, in week three, Kyle won HOH and, and Kyle had this sort of chaotic week where he was nominating his own alliance for eviction over and over. And that sort of, got the, the floor to fall out. And from there, everyone was afraid to form an alliance. They were afraid to put a name on something. And for me, that was really fun to play with. But I think because there was this solid alliance or actually two alliances early on and Kyle kind of broke that, it created this chaotic energy that sort of um, started gaining speed then and didn't stop until the end of the game. And you thrive in the chaos. Well, I think going in also viewing it as a game really helped me. Um, it, some people and, and some people who've done the show view it as like, this is real life. I, I don't. Mm. I don't see it as real life at all. I see it as a fun, I mean, an unbelievably fun game. And because I did that, when something chaotic happens, sure, my life in the game might be in danger, but I'm not going to die. I'm not going to leave this dead right like this is unbelievably fun this is a game that 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 i'm playing so to go in and have chaos happen for me yeah i I thrive because i look at it as an opportunity and if i try to to work through the chaos and i fail that's okay i'm I'm having a good time doing it so let's go back in time to may arisa cox calls your name yeah. And you are the winner of Big Brother Canada Season 10. Josh and Kevin, it's time to announce our winner. One at a time, I'll let you know who the voter was and who they voted for. If you hear your name, that's a good thing. You need five votes to win. Good luck to you both. Canada has voted for Kevin. Yes. Herman has voted for Kevin. Yes. Moose has voted for Kevin. Yes. Gino has voted for 
Kevin. Yeah. One more vote. And that's a wrap. Summer has voted for Kevin. Yes, Congratulations, Kevin. Kevin. You have won season 10 of Big Brother Canada. You can both now make your way out of the house. In that moment when she calls your name, what what went through your mind? So for some context here, um, Helena, my, my, my closest ally, she leaves at the final four. And then we actually had about s- five or six days after that, before the finale. And I was convinced that for me to win, I had to win the final HOH and I had to cut Josh. And I'll explain that in a second. Um, so when you, you don't have any contact with the outside world. So when you get an idea in your head, it can really, really get in your head. And because that was my idea, um, which was based a lot on Josh winning competitions, which historically, including last season, um, people, the jury tends to value. That's usually the person who wins. I did not win competitions. Um, I was convinced I'd lost. So Josh uh, decides to evict Betty. We go to the final two. And then I was under the impression that I was losing. I thought I might have three votes. Now, we get to make our pitches to the jury. And when we did that, I I felt okay about how it went. But then Arissa starts reading the votes. I'm announced as the winner and I'd prepared for a lot of different scenarios in the game. Like I was always running the situations through my head, what would happen. And this was not one that I had spent the last few days thinking about the scenario where Josh wins the final HOH and I'm, and I'm I'm saying beside Josh. So uh, I, I was just in complete shock. I didn't have a reaction. I didn't jump up and celebrate. I just could not believe it. It seemed completely surreal. Looking back now, it was an unbelievable moment and I have the most incredible joy and happiness associated with it but in that moment I just did not know how to act and I think I was just in this state of shock Hmm. and we're we're a few months removed now how are you how how is it sinking in for you being the winner okay so for some context when you come out of the house it is a lot something like crossing the street can be overwhelming because you haven't heard the sounds of cars in in months and this right? is a real thing this is a real thing first the my girlfriend had to help me cross the street the the first day it's it it's it, because it's just such an adjustment to get back to real life um now my experience went about as well as it could have in a lot of ways but those first two three weeks were some of the 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 weirdest of my life because you're just getting, even getting back to your phone is a weird experience. Um, tr- the slow trickle in of news that you missed. Um, I mean, the, the, I, I'm still a st- I, I, Every year I do an Oscar pool. I do an Oscar pool and I pick my favorites and the, the, the experience of the Will Smith slap a couple of months <laughs> later was like such, such a weird thing. But looking back now, those first two, three weeks were an adjustment. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm, I'm just so, so happy for the experience I had. I'm doing really well. Uh, I went back to, to work quite quickly, which for me was, was a good decision because I needed some sort of structure. Uh, my, this, this dream of playing this game came true and I did it and it went as well as it could have, but I needed to get back to, to, uh, my career, to my family, to, to my partner. Right. Because I, I have such greater appreciation for those things because you're taken away from them for so long. So are you back to normal life, so to speak? I'd say, yeah, for the most part. I mean, some people talk about like, Hey, I'm, I'm not in this to, to make friends. I have some, I have some of the best friends in the world, but for my like 30 to 50 range friend i have i have room i have room for friends like i've made some friends for this experience i've met people from other reality shows um which has been really the the cool part of this um but for the most part yeah like i'm back to normal life i'm, I'm doing my job i'm 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 big this is a weird one i'm big into into networking like this this is giving me like an opportunity to open some doors hey i won big brother canada if i want to talk to someone 
Um, so right now, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm living an amazing, but normal and, and somewhat boring life. Are you fielding any interesting offers? Whether it's other reality shows, other TV shows, maybe even comedy. So right now, I mean, I'm I'm chatting to people if if they reach out. I'm not a I'm not a hard person to reach, <laughs> but if someone if someone has a, an offer or opportunity, I'm I'm listening to them. Um, that said, like the the Big Brother Canada winner um, path. I've learned is sort of mine to define. Like if you look at the, the winners, a couple of people have become, uh, or, or a couple of people were poker players. Um, not my thing. Um, there was a teacher went back to, to her regular job. Um, someone is, is I believe a lawyer. A lot of people, like there isn't, uh, um, Tashawn is, is going to be on, on the Amazing Race Canada, which is really cool. Um, but for me, it's, it's less of a question of what did these other people do and, and what can I do? And right now being someone who, you know, became known as, as a strategic person, I'm, I'm listening. I'm having, I'm having my coffees. I'm, 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 I'm doing a lot of virtual meetings. It's a lot easier than getting out there. And also the nice thing about technology is it breaks down time and space. I don't have to go meet someone at, uh, you know, Starbucks or whatever. Um, so I'm, I'm listening. I don't know what the next step is. I don't know if there will be a next step. If I stick with my current life and my career, I will be tremendously happy, but I am absolutely open to other situations. So the money or the title, which are you most, oh, which, which are you most proud of uh, winning, earning, so to speak? The title, the money, the money is going to, to all the, all the boring, safe things, you know, it's in, it's in, I'm, I'm, I'm saving it for, you know, hopefully buy it at home one day. Um, the, the title though, the title feels good. Like that, that is, that's something you dream of and to have that, like, that's something that, that, you know, nobody, nobody can ever take away. I saw, I saw someone today. I don't know. I, I, I try not to read the too many of the comments online, but someone's like, so I'm, I'm friends with someone for the show, Gino, right? And someone, someone commented like, <laughs> Gino, I can't believe you're friends with this person after what he did to you. And yeah, I, I backstabbed him in the context of a reality TV show competition game. <laughs> but like, can't take away that I won. Mm. Sorry, stranger on the internet. <laughs> but for that stranger, it's, it's life, right? Because they saw it and it's part of their life. Go figure. It's, yeah, it's so interesting to see how... Um, you're just this character on an edited television show and big brother's a little bit different because the feeds are there, yeah. but people really have such strong opinions, which I knew before. It's a really amazing, passionate fan base, but it's, it's cool to see it in context because even I, I know the, my fellow house guests, I would argue probably more than most people um, online, but, but it's, it's cool. And it's also terrifying how excited people get and how passionate they get about, you know, the person that they think they saw in that time. I can't wait to send home everybody that Canada loves. I'm going to be a monster because villainy is always more interesting than virtue. <laughs> I'm Kevin. I'm 28. I'm from Toronto, obviously. And I'm a sales engineer. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of Big Brother Canada. I know the game inside out. I've seen every episode, I've watched the feeds, I've listened to hours and hours of podcasts and media. Don't do it, Jed. No, you gotta go slow. It's so obvious. Let's be real. I am not a humble person. I have a pretty high IQ. I I'm gonna be the smartest house guest. And if you can't tell, I'm pretty charismatic. <laughs> if there's somebody smarter than me in the house, I am going to be so competitive with them. But I'm going to win this game by being a villain, by lying to people, by pitting them against each other. I don't think Canada's going to like me very much, and I'm good with that. <laughs> to get ready for the house, I've been biohacking. That's when you optimize your body by sort of programming it for optimal performance. Let's take a seat in the snow. I've been going outside in the snow wearing very little to expose my body to cold. I can get above the physical pain. I've been doing a lot of puzzles. I've been studying a lot of negotiation techniques. If you can save a hostage, you can get yourself off the block. <laughs> I'm absolutely strategizing. And now I'm ready 
to go into the BB can house and come out on top. You sick of me yet, Canada? Rainbow Country will return right after this. Hi, I'm Justin Ling, author of Missing from the Village. You're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. Canada's LGBTQ2 Plus archives just released Out North, an archive of queer activism and kinship in Canada. Order a copy from your local bookstore to dive into hundreds of loud and proud stories and photos of historical queer life in Canada from pre-1939 to today. Get your copy from your local bookstore. Out North, an archive of queer activism and kinship in Canada. Bill 7. To ban discrimination in employment, government services, and housing, based on a person's sexual orientation, was up for a vote at Queen's Park. Most NDP and Liberal MPPs supported the bill, but without some progressive conservative legislators' backing, a divisive split could rack the province. Four PCs decided to break party ranks to vote with their conscience and support Bill 7. Cabinet Minister and MPP Dennis Timbrell did it to show solidarity for his beloved brother, the well-known drag queen, Rusty Ryan. And for me, a gay politician who was not yet out, I had to take a stand. We were known as the Gang of Four. I'm former Cabinet Minister and MPP Phil Gillies. The date, December 2nd, 1986, when LGBT rights came to Ontario. Hi, I'm Gord Depp of the Spoons. You're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. get turned on to Big Brother, this this game, this experiment, this experience? When did you first get turned on to it? It's kind of a unique story. So I remember 2001, I'm sitting in my living room and I watch Richard Hatch win season one of Survivor, okay, um, with my family. And at that time, Survivor was, and it still is, is massive. But at that time, it was like the biggest thing in pop culture for those first couple seasons. I never stopped watching Survivor. I still haven't. Um, I guess it must be like six years ago or so. I'd always, I'd always sort of watched some Big Brother here and there, but never really got into it around six years ago. I think whenever Big Brother Canada 5 was, I heard that there was a guy named Kevin who was doing something unique in the end game. And what that is, is, is Kevin Martin. He won season five of big brother Canada. And he had noticed a pattern in the competitions where basically he could study for them in a certain way. Um, and I think a lot of it was his, was his mindset as well as the setting that, that actually got him to the end. And he ended up winning, but I was so interested by the idea that this person had prepped so hard for this show that it was actually helping them. And then after that, I started watching, I believe it was Big Brother 19 right after where um, Josh Martinez won. And then I caught up and I did the, the super fan thing. I watched every season after. I listened to the podcast. I went back and watched old seasons and, and got the full download. And from then on, I've really loved the game. What I, what I love about Big Brother are a couple of things. One is I do like the, five, the, the live feeds. Um, I think it's... A, it's a really interesting way to consume media and people who watch them. It's not just a show at that point. It's, it's a lifestyle. Um, Two is it's, it's very fluid in that 
the gameplay is always individual, but you need to work with other people, right? So you have 16 or 14 or however many people each season, and each person has, let's say there's 16 people, each person has 15 relationships. That is an incredibly difficult thing to navigate, and for me, that's fascinating. So I'd say the place where I come from is, is a love of, uh, of games, I think that's really what it is. I really, really love games. And maybe that also is is the reason why my philosophy is, oh, this is just a game. You got on to season 10 of Big Brother Canada. Have you applied to other seasons before? Um, I can't really talk about it too much, but yes. <laughs> and so you, you applied before to other seasons. Yeah. What made you decide to go for this season? to apply again come season 10 it's really it's really hard to take three months off of your life it's not the easiest thing to do especially when when you do have plans for the future um this this year and last year were a really good time where i could take that opportunity um i'm not I mean, age is just a number, but I'm not yet 30. And I feel like I'm still in a position. I'm going to say that until I'm 40, I'm, I'm no, I'm going to say for the rest of my life, I'm ready to take big risks. Let's not, let's not put them. Don't limit yourself. Yeah. Why, why not? Like it's, why not take a big swing? The worst thing that could possibly happen is that you go on and you get voted out first and you have a cool uh, fact when you're going around a room saying a funny fact about your, a cool fact about yourself. Um, and then the best case scenario is, is, is this. And the way I think about risk taking as well is that if you make a mistake it's okay. Like you just learn from that and and you go from there. These of course are super high stakes mistakes because they're televised and for a bunch of money. Um, But this just felt like a really good time in my life to, to take a big swing. And I went into this year saying at some point this year, whether it's big brother, whether it's something else, I just want to do something a little bit wild because I am someone who does sometimes get a little bit bored with the Monday and everyday life. And that's a me problem. Mm so for me my perspective you on the show on season 10 of big brother canada you were and i mean this in in the best way possible you were nerdy you were yeah to to to, to use a a big brother phrase you were offbeat you were <laughs> you were clever you were intelligent you were calculating you were even athletic at times but you were also wow, athletic. Yes, but you were okay. You were also, that's the first. Well, you were. Sorry, go on. <laughs> but you were also very funny and very entertaining. Do you think that you have created a new archetype for Big Brother, especially when it comes to casting? That in future they may be looking for, you know, a Kevin Jacobs type, someone who is is intelligent, but someone who also brings the entertainment factor, because ultimately, this is a TV show, it's a reality show. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think that you have created a new archetype for the game? Yeah, so that that's, that's an interesting thing to think about. It's, it's not something I have in that I've thought about in that context before, because um Going into the season, I'm the the nerdy villain super fan. That's a, that's a pretty common archetype. However, usually that person burns out quite early, uh, or they're I, not I entertaining. Right? Yeah. So I think part of what helped me to to not only get far in the game but also um, be entertaining to to some people. Thank you. Uh, was that this was not an end by the way, like the big brother Canada experience is, is one of the best things I've ever done in my life. It's one of the best things I ever will do. However, no matter what happened, I was not going to let this experience define me and who I am. I think most people going into the show as the super fan character have this idea that this is going to be their personality. They're going to win the game and they're going to be the big brother Canada winner. And they're going to go on their, their, their press tour and and people will see them as, as uh, a God. And when this didn't happen for a lot of people, it can be devastating. I would have been devastated if I was out early, but also this is not defining for me. So I think what, what 
I would look for is super fans, is villains, except people who also want to have a good time. Because for me, the number one goal above winning was to enjoy myself. And I knew that if I had fun, other people might have fun too in the house, in the audience otherwise. And so that was really my main goal. So whether it's a new archetype, I, I'm not sure, but I do know that the more people who are in there having a good time and also playing to win as one of their goals, I think can only be a, a, a good thing. Like this is a fun thing. Let's make it that this is not the it's just it's not the most serious thing in the world can we not treat it as the most serious thing in the world this is fun it's entertainment this is this is not the house of commons like let's enjoy this (laughs) do you think you're a funny person i find me funny I found you very funny, and I have to say that you you brought some funny moments that played out on on the live feeds on the TV show. You uh, some of your greatest hits: Winter Baby, Vitamin D. Don't forget, uh, <laughs> you made some spaghetti, a lot of spaghetti. Oh yeah! But the lawyer, that character, where does that character come from? Um. So so. Gino okay so so you have to share beds in the house right um there are two rooms eight people in one room seven people in the other at the beginning of the season the HOH is in their own room so I had to share a bed with with Gino that's its own situation where you're negotiating on night one and you're trying to figure out where to go um starting with a negotiation with the lawyer so around I guess the second and third week him and JC Lynn who are who are uh together now um you know started flirting okay so they're gonna start sharing a bed sometime soon right so i was doing this bit before gino was hoh where i was saying that gino and i were were getting a a a divorce and we had to figure out a way to navigate the beds and i'd be sharing with someone else and there was a lot of negotiation going and then by the time week four rolled around gino wins hoh um, this was right after actually him and JC Lynn were, were blindsided a little bit. So nobody really knew where he would go or what he would do. I needed a way to just have a good time and bring that sort of uh, uh, joy to my interaction with him. And the lawyer seemed like a really good way to go because these med- these HOH meetings that they hold can be so intense and so awkward that it's just not fun. And if it's not fun, it's a very easy you're going to figure out a way to rationalize putting somebody up on the block when they're not a good time. So I took this lawyer bit and I brought it to him and it was just, it it takes the pressure out of the air. Like if you're having, if you walk into a store and somebody's trying to sell you something um, and they say, you know, come look at this, let me show you all the features. It can be not really that engaging, but if you walk into a store and someone says, Hey, like, how can I help you? What are you, what are you looking for? Or do you even want to talk to me? It's a lot more interesting than the first one. So sort of what I'm trying to say is taking the air out of the so-called like sales conversation or HOH negotiation conversation is really important. And for me, dressing up as the lawyer was also just fun. There's not a lot to do there. I don't get to wear my suit. So let me have a good time and let it be contagious. Was this lawyer, was this something that just just randomly came up and you created while they're in the house or was this a pre-existing character that you you had because of your 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 background in comedy no that was this well i think my background in comedy helped me to create that character um so i've done training at at the second city in in toronto as well as other uh improv troops there's actually a good group called the assembly here um and 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 i'm sort of more focused on on long form improv where you know you get one suggestion and you go for 30 or or 45 minutes and a lot of it can be like really grounded in character and you have to find out um what what lens does this person see the world through so i have that that sort of basis or training there but no that that was the the day the day andrew was brought out was the day that that i i sort of created him and then it's also a process of discovery right so you don't have to have everything defined in advance you can I, I guess it's the improv background that says just jump into it and, and see what happens and, and find ways to rationalize the the lawyer's behavior or, or whatever it is. And that's, that's, I, I think that's another thing about 
um, and, and, and we talked about comedy a, a little bit um, during, during my exit interview, I think. Um, I, I do think improv training specifically is a really, really good way, not only to, to train for, you know, tough conversations, but also just for life and communication. Um, the idea of saying yes to things, of uh, being open to possibilities, being open to suggestions is is only a good thing because basically the first rule of improv is don't say no. And that doesn't mean don't say no the word. It means don't, don't reject what someone is putting out into the world. Like if I say that we're um, at a bowling alley, we're, we're, don't, don't say great, we're in, we're in a dream and you know we're not in a bowling alley. So the idea that to take what people are offering you and collaborate, um, I think is just the most helpful thing in the world, not only in Big Brother, but also just in life. Since your time in the Big Brother Canada house, have you reached out to, or have they reached out to you, your former uh, comedy troupe uh, people? <laughs> no, no, they haven't. Um, well, screw them. They, you know, there's actually, <laughs> screw that now there's there's one guy um there's actually one guy who i was in a group with um he got married over over the weekend so congratulations to ryan um and he it's so funny because this was a guy i met like probably two years ago in in an improv group and he wanted a suggestion from the, the crowd as he said like uh I, it was something to do with Survivor. And then after I said, well, you know, how big of a Survivor fan are you, Ryan? And he said, well, I'm huge. Though we found out we both paid <laughs> paid for the same podcast, basically. Um, we watched Survivor and Big Brother Canada together one night. The next thing you know, I'm on the show and he's he's watching me, which I found really funny. So we're, we're still in touch. Um, but that that's that's it. I might, who knows, maybe I'll show up at, at uh, Second City one day and do some more some more classes or somewhere else in toronto there's actually a lot of good improv okay so i i have to go here okay go there and i'm going into the hoh room with helena jc lynn gino marty and yourself yes. and a ha- and a yeah. handful of gummy bears what are your thoughts on what happened Ultimately, with Gino being the replacement because of the gummy bear uh, picking, what are your thoughts on all of that, and why why Marty did this, and and what are your thoughts on all of this? So Marty was back and forth about who his uh, replacement nominee would be, and the choices were basically me and JC Lynn, and he he got close to putting me up because he he Helena was his closest ally. And uh, he didn't. He had this thing with Gino where he kept turning on Gino and then feeling really bad about it, and then going back to Gino. And he didn't want to upset Gino, who was with Jason. So the night before, he holds meetings with each of us one on one. Eventually, we all convinced him that we would vote the way he wanted. And I just, I don't want to go on the block. Like I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna just agree to go on the block, right? In that moment, it didn't make sense to me, and I also wasn't sure that I would stay. So Marty also has this thing where he's thinking about the game in the context of a viewer sometimes. So he had this idea for the gummy bears, which I think was partially for the game and also partially for TV. And you know what? Like it it was good TV. Um, So about an hour before the, the nomination ceremony, or the, the POV ceremony, he pulls us into his HOH room. He told me and Gino that he was still undecided and we're like, how are you going to decide? And he, t- he, he gets us all to confirm we're in. So sure. Yeah, I'm in whatever. And then he pulls out this canister and I knew what it was. And I just started laughing because again, it's just contextualizing it in this game, in the, in, in the idea that this is just, it, it's so big brother because it's so stupid it is so stupid but it's so serious because there's money on the line and people don't trust Mm -hmm. each other and you're trying to navigate who's telling the truth and who's not um unfortunately poor gino pulled the uh 
the the red gummy bear and and the truth is the the, the guy sort of fit, fits the mold of what a lot of uh winners look like um you know sort of strong alpha males basically and i felt like at that point in the game for me to go further or for me to have a chance at winning i needed to get gino out just because he's just a likable guy who if he's at the end it's a very easy thing for people to agree yep he he was a big threat. He got to the end. He he overcame certain things. Um, as for like its place in in the sort of lore of the show, it's something that, that I haven't thought about too much. But I do think that it is a real. It's probably the moment of the season, and it is just an epic, ridiculous, fun thing. And I think the key point is fun. Like yeah, our lives are in danger over this gummy, but it's not our lives. It's our lives in a simulated dramatic game. And right. It's it's just so you couldn't you couldn't make it up. I remember it happening, and there was still there there was half an hour to kill before the ceremony, and I was just sitting in in my room with with just just sitting there with a sweatshirt on, like I had I was I was inside of my hood, just like like deep in thought. I was like, don't speak to anyone, don't look at anyone. This can't be real. This can't be real. This is too ridiculous. This can't be real. And then it happened, and and from then on, it's like this 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 whole experience is just. Uh, epic. epic. <laughs> Kevin, I just have a handful of minutes left. But your your gameplay in Big Brother Canada season 10 is is being compared to the likes of Dr. Will, uh Derek Lavasser, Dan Giesling, and now Kevin Jacobs. What are your thoughts on that? That that your gameplay is amongst Ah, those names. What are your thoughts on it's, that? It's the most unbelievable feeling in the world. That said, um, it's it's a really fun thing for people to debate. I'll I'll never say that, you know, I'm in I'm in that category. I'll leave that to other people. And also I'm not going to derive any sort of uh self-value or 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 confidence from that conversation because it's so sort of out there and also like not that relevant to how I live my life. It is simply the most flattering thing in the world. Um, my hope is that in the future, some people adopt a similar style of, of gameplay in that it's, it's, it's kind of fun. It's, it's kind of fun when you go in just, you know, sort of, uh, playing that chaotic game just having a good time so if more people do that i'll 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 be happy but as for where where i i I mean it's still it's still absurd to hear myself mentioned amongst those people and i don't really have a great answer for for what the only thing i can say is that coming out (laughs) because you haven't been in contact with the world and then the first contact really is the the exit press. And then for people to bring that up in the exit press after I haven't spoken to anyone outside of these house guests for three months is, <laughs> is one of the, the most odd experiences you'll ever have. It probably took me about two weeks in the house to get used to the house and then a similar time to get used to, to real life. There's a compression and a decompression period, but I, I mean, it's, I don't know. It's still it's still weird to hear to hear my name amongst uh, you know the people that that I look up to so much. Mm-hmm. I have to say, I have to say, Kevin Jacobs, thank you so much for your time. Well said, well done, well played. Mark Tara, thank you so much. This was a fun one today. Big Brother U.S. Season 24 airs on Global TV. Big Brother Canada Season 11 returns to Global TV in 2023. And for all things Jacobs, you can find Kevin Jacobs on socials. And just like that, this little gay journey through Rainbow Country has come to an end. For the full two-hour episode, head over to marktara.com where everything is connected and hit the archives banner. Don't forget to keep up to date with the show. Follow me on socials at marktara. The podcast is available on all major platforms, including audible.com and iHeartRadio. And finally, I want to take this time to thank you for taking your time to be with me. Remember, 
despite all the craziness that's going on in the world these days. Hold true to this. We are living in days of making dreams come true, so believe in yourself. And the world will believe in you. Hi, I'm Keegan Hurst, former professional rugby player, coach, raving homosexual, and you're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tarrant. Mm. 